Please remain standing for the reading of the gospel. It comes from Luke, the seventh chapter, verses 36 through the end. One of the Pharisees asked Jesus to eat with him, and he went to the Pharisee's house and took his place at the table. And a woman in the city who was a sinner, having learned that she was eating in a he was eating in a Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster jar of ointment. She stood behind him at his feet weeping began to bathe his feet with her tears and to dry them with her hair. Then she continued kissing his feet and anointing them with the ointment. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw it, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what kind of woman this is who is touching him, but she is a sinner. Jesus spoke up and said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. Teacher, he replied, speak. A certain creditor had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. When they could not pay, he canceled the debts for both of them. Now which of them will love him more? Simon answered, I suppose the one for whom he canceled the greater debt. Jesus said to him, you have judged rightly. Then turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she's bathed my feet with her tears and dried them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore I tell you, her sins, which were many, have been forgiven. Hence she is shown, shown great love. But for the one to whom little is forgiven, lots little, then he said to her, your sins are forgiven. But those who were at the table with him began to say among themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. The word of God for the people of God. You may be seated. Okay, just some things we got to know about the scripture, just in case you don't know stuff about the scripture. There is some confusing stuff in here. First of all, a denarius was a day's wage. It was a small copper coin. It was a day's wage. So 500 denarii was 500 days' wage. And if you give somebody ten dollars an hour times eight is eighty times. 500 is $40,000 in today's money at minimum kind of wage right there. I did 10 because it's easier to multiply, all right? <laughs> I don't do my eights quite so well. So, 40 grand. Or if it's 50 denarii, 400. Now, he says, which do you think somebody's going to love you more for if you forgive them 40 grand or 400? That's a no-brainer, isn't it? Right? The 40 grand. The, the greater amount. So we got that part of the story. The second part of the story is they didn't sit at table, they reclined. Tables were short. And it was kind of like our kids when they were young and they'd sit in front of the TV uh, and lay down in front of the TV, you'd put a bowl of chips in their head and their feet were at the other end stinking up the rest of the house, right? But that way their feet were under them where they would have to smell them while they ate. Amen? Amen. Alright, so that was the way Jesus was laying at the table. His head was at the table and his body came out from the table and his feet were out here where the table was over here. So, that helps us to understand what was going on in the story, at least the physical parts of the story, right? So, what is going on here? The good people in town, the Pharisee and his buddies, right? The good people. Right? Good, you know, you know about good people in town. Had Jesus over for lunch. And when he comes in, he reclines at the table, and all the good people are gathered there. And they know they're good. They do everything right. Pharisees are supposed to know what to do, right? And they do it right. They're good people. Kind of like us. Right? Come on. Come on. Good people. Good people. <clears throat> and then a woman who's not such a good person comes in. 
Now, I love this story because it doesn't really say what her sin is. You know, if her sin was being a thief, and I wasn't a thief, then I'm off the hook, right? Or if her sin was this or that or whatever, and I'm not that kind of person, then I can still be a good person. Oh, I love this. this you're doing good today. I'm proud of you. A good person. So she comes in just as she was a sinner. Or if you're Southern, she is a sinner. <laughs> One of those sinful women, right? You know what I mean? She was bad. See, folks, I know, I know you Methodists. I've been one all my life. I'm one of us, right? Us Methodists, we come into church, and while we're inside this building, we can say, I'm a sinner in need of the grace of God. And we say it, but we know we're good people. Come on. <laughs> I'm a sinner in name only. But I don't really, I don't, I don't see myself as one of them. And this woman comes in, and she's one of them. It's not really sinner, it's good, bad, isn't it? Because we don't equate when we say sin into bad. I doubt any of us in the room think we're bad people. But we all sin, amen. <laughs> and the problem in this story is we think good means okay. Right? I remember preaching a sermon uh, at a funeral for the best guy in my church who died. I mean, the number one. Everybody in the church would have said he was number one. His name was Ed. He'd been a postman. He'd been in the community his whole life. He served people right and left. He was as good as good can get. And in, in his funeral sermon, I said, Ed was one of the best people in the whole wide world, and one of the best people I've ever known. He was a good man, but his goodness will not get him into heaven. So the only reason any of us gets to go to heaven, and the only reason Ed got to go to heaven, is because Jesus loves him. Period. I had a phone call that week from the lady that had come to that service. She wasn't one of ours. And she let me have it. What do you mean he doesn't get to go to heaven because he was a good man? He was a good man. How dare you say Ed wasn't a good man? I said, I didn't say he wasn't a good man. I said he was a good man. I said his goodness has nothing to do with getting into heaven. It doesn't. I don't get to go to heaven because I'm good. I can't get good enough. I go to heaven because Jesus Christ loves me, died for me, came and forgives me, and lets me have a place in His kingdom. Not anything I can do to deserve that. Right? But then this woman comes in the room. And she's one of them. Bad. She kneels at his feet and she begins to cry. She's so moved by the forgiveness. Obviously, he's, he's already forgiven her her sins. The forgiveness, and she begins to cry. She's crying so much, she can wash his feet with that. That's a lot of tears. And then she pulls her hair out. Did you know my grandmother Atkinson, I only saw her, all of her hair, twice in my entire life because she kept it in a bun. She never cut it. And she got out of the tub and I walked in the bedroom to get something one time where she was staying when she was with us and she had her hair down and she was beginning to roll it up and put it in that bun and said, Grandma, I didn't know you had that much hair. She could sure make a lot of hair fit in a little spot. It was amazing. She nearly killed my Aunt May because my mother got on the train to go to Aunt Mays in Tennessee, and it was one of those old steam locomotives, and the windows were down because it was hot, and she got cinders and all kinds of stuff in her hair, and Mama had never never had her hair cut. She was 14 years old, never had a haircut in her life. And she had that bushy, curly kind of hair, you know? Still does. She got more hair than I did. It's not bad. And my aunt, my great aunt saw her, and she said, come on. 
And we went down to the beauty shop and they bought her hair and my grandmother nearly never forgave my hair. <laughs> this woman comes in not only with her tears as she washed Jesus' feet, she takes her hair out. Her one glory. The only thing she probably had that meant anything to her. She pulls it out and she begins to dry his feet with her hair. That's huge, folks. And then she takes ointment, which she probably cannot afford, and begins to rub his feet. Massage. Anybody like a foot massage today? <laughs> what does Simon say to himself? He says, who the heck she thinks she is? Now, if he was Texan, that's exactly what he would have said. <laughs> Except it wouldn't have been heck, would it? Who the heck she thinks she is coming in here like that? Yeah, right? Who does she think she is? What kind of woman does she think she is to come in my house? And Jesus, knowing all things, looks at Simon and tells a story. Two guys have debts. One's five hundred forty thousand dollars One's four hundred dollars That the uh, God forgives both debts. Which one loves him more? And says, well, the one that got forgiven more. And she says, she has many sins. I've forgiven them. And that's why she loves me so much. But you didn't even kiss me when I came in. You didn't give me water for my feet. And you gave me no oil for my head. You did not anoint me. You, obviously, he's saying, you sure don't think you need me, do you? It's tough being good people sometimes, isn't it? You see, what we figured out in the Wednesday study where we looked at the scripture on Wednesday night was, was that some people come in the room expecting forgiveness. Expecting. God's always forgiven me. He'll forgive me again today. I come in expecting it. It's something that should happen. It's going to happen. I know it's going to happen. Not just because I have faith that it's going to happen. I'm kind of to the place now where I just know God's going to do that for me, don't you? Come on, be honest. Don't you expect God to love you? Expect God to forgive you? Expect God to be with you? Expect God? It's almost like, come on, God, do your job. Maybe it's because we think we're good people. God doesn't have to work too hard on us. You can go to someone else now, God, you've done nothing with me. Those people really need it. And then those people that come in the room and they know how much they really need it. Is there a difference between expecting and appreciating? She comes in appreciating. What are the sermons about this year? Gratitude, right? She is eternally great and the gift Jesus Christ has given her. And she's going to go live the rest of her life out of that gratitude that he has placed in her heart. And it's never going to be different. And Simon's sitting there going, but I deserve it. I've been a good man. We better watch out, church, because I don't think that's where we want to be. Remember another service I got to go get ready for. You know, those people that that have been to a wedding so they think they, they died Methodist, you know. And, and I went into the house and the lady's there that I've never seen before and never saw her again until she died. That was about a year later and I did her service too. And she comes in and I'm sitting there listening to them about this man and she says, well, he gets to go to heaven, Pastor, because he was a good man. You hear that silence? Same silence that early worship when I said. Kind of echoes in here. We don't get to go to heaven. Because we're good. We're good because we're grateful. We live our lives as saved, forgiven, loved, grace filled faith-filled people because we realize what the gift really is, how big it is, how big a deal it is to get to go to His table.
Carol was Ed's daughter. Carol was an eighth grade history and English teacher. She was a saint also, because anybody who teaches eighth grade English and history <laughs> is a saint. Because there's nobody worse in the whole wide world than an eighth grader, right? <laughs> eighth graders, eighth grade. I remember being in eighth grade. I was still a kid in the way I acted and a man in my body, right? And I thought I was the man and I really wasn't. Right? How many of y'all can remember back that far? Some of the y'all, that's the only thing you can remember is back that far. I got it, all right. <laughs> I'm getting there. But she taught eighth grade. Every year, the first week of class, she would pick out the worst student in her class. The most honoring, mean spirited kid in that class, and she would write their name down, stick it on her mirror. And every night when she went to bed, brushing her teeth, she would pray for that child. And every morning when she got up and brushed her teeth, she'd pray for that child. One year the girl was particularly bad. And it never changed. It was about this time of year. It had gone that long. She'd been praying, praying, praying. Nothing's working in the prayer life there, God. Uh, she's not changing. And the girl is climbing over three desks to punch out another girl in class. You think that doesn't happen? Come on. <coughs> Crawling over three desks to punch out another girl that had said something. And Carol goes, you, Hall, now. That's the way teachers talk. Have you ever figured that out? They don't use complete sentences either. I love it. <laughs> you, Hall, now. They get out of the hall. I don't know what it is with you. Why can't you get it right? You have every opportunity in the world to be the right kind of person. I have worked so hard this year to turn you around and get you pointed in the right direction. You can't be somebody, but you've got to do it now or it will be too late. Please change. Please. Miss Rose. praying for you the rest of this year. And I'll pick a new one next year, but I just want the prayer to work for you. And the anger turned to tears. You pray for me? Yes. Why? Because God put you in my heart. And I cannot let you go. She washed Carol Rook's feet with her tears. And he fell as a beautiful testament to what can happen when somebody figures out they're loved. When somebody figures out they can be forgiven, they'll be loved anyway. And Jesus says, she gets it. Church, why do you? What do you say in this story, God? Church, why do you? Okay, just a few minutes left, so let's get real. Between now and Saturday, thousands of women who don't speak English, all different countries around the world, are going to be brought into. Arlington, Rain Prairie, Fort Worth, Irving, Hearst, Hewlett, Bedford, Dallas, and they're going to be sold <coughs> to men who won one. That's the truth. Slaves. Human trafficking right now is bigger in the world than it was during before the Civil War. $32 billion a year industry. We 
we, church, this week need to be in prayer for those women. We used to think it was their fault. Oh, one of those kind of women, right? It's not their fault. It's, it's the men who steal them. It's the men who use them. It's their fault. And we need to be in prayer about that. It was just wrong. Wrong. And you may not think you can make a difference, but you're going to see one of those women this week. You're not going to know who they are, but odds are you will see one of them at a restaurant or a fast food place or something. And, and you don't know that you might not be the one that makes a difference for her. You might. I think her name was Ostrom. She went to Travis Avenue Methodist Episcopal Church South in the 1890s. At Market, she met another woman that looked a lot like her, dressed in the finest clothes. And they began over the years to develop a relationship well, she didn't know that Miss Volvino, Volvino, excuse me, Volvino, owned a house where men came. Somehow Miss Volvino heard a preacher on the streets and something happened in her and she goes to Miss Ostrom and she confesses who she is and what she does. And she says, I need help. And she ends up going to church <coughs> at Travis Avenue. And the, the side story is that there was a hush that came over the building amongst all the men when she walked in the room. She gave her life to Jesus Christ. And then, at the, the whim of a, the pastor, he said, what if this, this house that has been going down a, a dark river was to change course? What would that be like? She gave her home as a home for unwed mothers. And that home today just had its name changed. It used to be the Methodist Mission Home in San Antonio where thousands upon thousands of babies have been adopted. Now it's called Providence Place because they kept getting mixed up with the one in Waco. Mm -hmm. Just a conversation in the market. That's all it took. Over time, for somebody to be freed somebody not not just to give a little how much do you think she loved Jesus for what he'd done in her heart she didn't give some she gave everything everything what the heck is she doing here who does she think she is Let's pray.